Hi everyone, this is another video on the topic of modern optimization and it is also the part two of the last video on the topic of automatic programming of computers with genetic programming and grammatical evolution. This part two will introduce a famous automatic programming algorithm called grammatical evolution. Remember, when the last video ended, it highlighted that when evolving the computer programs automatically, a big issue is that grammatically or syntactically invalid instructions can be generated. Grammatical evolution takes care of that. First off, a bit of background. Grammatical evolution, or GE, was proposed in 1998 by Ryan et al at the Biocomputing and Developmental Systems Group in Ireland. Unlike genetic programming, as introduced in the last video, grammatical evolution, or GE, can generate computer programs in any programming language. To evolve the programs in a language of your choice, the user of GE must write a grammar, a grammar that describes the syntactical rules of the language. GE uses a special kind of grammars called the con context-free grammars. These grammars are used often to describe computer languages. Unlike GP or genetic programming that uses tree structures to represent evolving programs, GE instead uses strings of integers, much like uh, uh, genetic algorithms do. This string of integers, which is also called a GE chromosome, is then translated into a human readable program through a carefully designed process. How does that happen? Well, remember the context-free grammar we talked about? Yes, well, that grammar helps in this translation process. But first, let us see how we write that grammar. Context-free grammars are written out in a special notation called the Bacchus Nor form. This is a well-known notation in computer science. This notation is used to define the rules of a context-free grammar. These rules are also called the production rules. Overall, a grammar represented in the Bacchus Nor form requires you to specify four things. You need to know what symbols appear in the valid sentences of the language that you are going to define. These symbols are called the terminal symbols. Then you define N, that is a set of non-terminal symbols. These are interim symbols that are used to define the structure of the sentences but these symbols do not themselves appear in the final sentences themselves. You will see shortly what that means. Then you must define a set of production rules that show how a set of non-terminals and terminals are put together to complete the grammar. And finally, there's something called a start symbol, which is represented by S. If all of that is hazy, do not worry. Let's see an example. So here I shall present a very simple context-free grammar that can generate any arithmetic expression involving two variables A and B. The start symbol S, in this case, equals a non-terminal that we'll call expra. It is common to put angle brackets around the non-terminals. Now, expra means nothing to us, does it? So how can it lead to arithme arithmetic expressions? So let us write the first production rule. And this production rule states that an expra can expand into an expra plus another expra. Notice we still don't know what an expra is. All we know is that whatever it is, we can add one of its kind to another. So this is our first rule and we call it rule number zero. 
Now, is that it? No, arithmetic expressions also involve subtraction. So let's see that option. So we write that option here. An extra can also subtract another extra. Notice to give another option for the non-terminal extra, we use this vertical bar-like symbol. So this is our second option or rule number one. Another option is that an, that an arithmetic an expression, an arithmetic expression may multiply with another arith arithmetic exp expression as well. So that is our rule number three. Likewise, uh, an arithmetic uh, expression may divide with another as well. So that's rule four. But so far, we have not specified what extra is. It is an abstract thing, with, isn't it? So we say that an extra can resolve into a variable A or a variable B. Notice even though we had six rules, they were numbered 0 through 5. As we shall see later, grammatical evolution uses this fact later on. Also note that uh, while the extra was a non-terminal, uh, all the while the extra was a non-terminal, and hence it was enclosed in uh, angle brackets, uh, whereas the symbols in blue are all terminal symbols. This means later when we shall produce actual arithmetic expressions from this grammar, these expressions will only contain these terminal symbols. Now the question is, now that this grammar is in place, how does GE produce different expressions from it? I mentioned that GE chromosomes are strings of integers. Typically, these uh, integers range between 0 and 255. But we want to produce programs. Remember, even an arithmetic expression is a program. A small program, but a program nonetheless. Remember also that we can use context-free grammars. But how do we do that? In fact, where did this string of integers come from? Well, typically, GE employs a genetic algorithm to produce these strings or chromosomes. And inside the fitness function of that genetic algorithm, these strings are translated into a program. Okay, fine, you say. But how do we translate this strange bunch of numbers into a program? Well, the translation process is called a mapping process in GE. This mapping process begins by looking at the start of the grammar. Remember, I said that the grammar has a start symbol, which in this case is the non-terminal expra. Now, for this non-terminal expra, we have six rules to choose from. What do we do? Well, that's where the GE chromosome guides us. So we read in the first integer from the chromosome, and that is 60, but we only have six rules to choose from. So we must convert 60 into a valid rule index. To do that, we make use of the remainder operator or the mod operator, so to speak. The remainder operator or the mod operator are, are, are available in any programming language of your choice. So for instance, if you're using R, R provides a remainder operator as well. So what does the remainder operator do? Well, if you divide an integer by another integer, then the remainder operator or the mod operator produces the remainder. That means if you divide 60 by 6, then the remainder must be 0. So 60 mod 6 produces 0. As a result of this 0, we pick the rule number 0 from the set of choices that is available. Notice when we mod with 6, it will always produce a number between 0 and 5. Hence, that means we are always able to produce a valid rule index. And this is why we were using the mod operator. So the rule number zero is expra add another expra. That's fine. 
but previously we had one extra and now we have two. So which one do we resolve next? Well, as a principle, GE picks the leftmost non-terminal. So we shall resolve the left extra first. Now to resolve this, uh, the, the left extra again, we have six choices. And to resolve it, we follow the same process as before, but this time we read the second integer, which is 14. Again, we use the mod operator and we compute 14 mod 6, and that produces the number 2, which is extra times extra. Now remember, we were resolving the leftmost extra in the expression at the top of the slide, right? So we replace the leftmost extra with extra times extra. And then we add another extra as on the top of the slide. Well, we had started off with just one extra and now we have three. Well, don't lose hope and keep resolving the extras. And as before, stick to the leftmost non-terminal. Well, again, we have six choices. So we read the third integer, which is 64. We mod it with six to produce choice number four. And this time it is a terminal symbol that is a variable A. So we replace the leftmost extra with A. Now we have two non-terminals left. So we must resolve the leftmost extra as before. Again, we, uh, we, uh, we have the same old six choices and we resolve it by reading the next integer, which is 125, uh, which picks rule number five, and hence the extra is replaced by the variable B. Now we are left with a single non-terminal. For the one final time, we go through the process again and read the fifth integer, that is 65, and this picks the rule number five again, and hence the variable B appears again. So our final readable expression is A times B plus B. Since no more non-terminals are left, the mapping completes. Notice the last three integers that I have yellow highlighted were not needed during this mapping process. In this particular example, this can happen in GE chromosomes. Unlike the GA chromosomes, where every number is needed during fitness evaluation, in a GE evaluation, sometimes all the numbers are not, re not needed. So to summarize this process, a genetic algorithm produces an integer string, such as that shown on the top of the slide. During the fitness function evaluation, this integer string is mapped into a readable program, as exemplified earlier. To do this mapping, a context-free grammar must be supplied, as appears on your screens here. And the mapping process begins with the start symbol of this grammar. The mapping process completes in multiple steps. Each of this step is called a mapping state. For instance, at the start, the mapping state is just the star symbol extra. And then we read the first integer, uh, which is 60, and use the mod function as shown below the, the integer string at the top of the slide, and that produce a new mapping state. And then we resolve the leftmost non-terminal to produce the next mapping state. And to do that, we read the second integer, that was 14. Uh, and then we resolve the, 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 the let me continue to resolve the leftmost uh, non-terminal symbols by reading more and more integers until all the non-terminals are either removed or we run out of the integers in our chromosome. Just a few notes. In this last example, mapping completed while we had read only five out of the eight possible integers. Three integers remained unused. That's okay. These integers are, uh, are just ignored because the mapping is just complete, completed. However, sometimes the mapping does not complete and we run out of integers. In this case, the fitness function returns a very bad fitness, often the worst possible fitness. This is done to discourage the presence of such chromosomes in future generations of the GA. Because of such a mapping, 
from chromosome to a program governed by the rules of the grammars, syntactically invalid solutions are never generated, as was possible in genetic programming. Now, while that was just a mathematical expression, question is, can we generate an executable program? The answer is yes. And in this lecture, I'm going to show you a very simple example, but trust me, uh, very complicated programs can also be generated by using the same metaphor. So suppose we want to generate a function in the R language. Uh, the name of the function is my fun, and it should have two parameters A and B. It should also compute some mathematical expression, store its result in a variable W, and return the result of the, uh, return this, uh, whatever is contained and computed inside W. So thus, we need to find the expression to be filled into the blank in front of W. We can write a grammar that GE can use to produce a function just like on your screens. So let's see such an example, such a grammar. Uh, the start, so here's a grammar. In this case, let's call the start symbol code. Okay, we can pick the non-terminals of our choice. So because we are going to write code, so let's suppose our start symbol is going to be called code. Let's say the code expands into a header, a function header, followed by an opening bracket, followed by some function body, uh, which is followed by a return statement, and this is followed by a closing bracket. Notice we have not specified what the header and the body are, but we can specify them using the subsequent production rules. So in the next rule, we define what the non-terminal header be expands into. And this expands into some R code, that is some code that declares an R function by fun. Next, we give a rule uh, that says what the non-terminal body expands into. And this states that a variable w will hold the result of some expression. That expression will be evolved later. Hence, it is represented by the non-terminal expra. Finally, we give uh, another rule that shows what our return statement looks like. As before, the rules of expra stay the same. Uh, as uh, appears on your uh, screen on the right side. Okay, and you can imagine these rules can add to the, the grammar on the left side. So the overall ex grammar uh, expands into a much larger grammar. Uh, as before, GE will use a chromosome to pick the rules from this combined grammar to produce a valid R function. And that valid R function looks like this. Here, the code in blue represents the erect arithmetic expression that was produced by mapping a GE chromosome. This function can then be executed to see how well it solves the task at hand. So grammatical evolution has been hugely popular in the field of evolutionary algorithms. It has invited research and applications from all over the world you can search for grammatical evolution on Google or Google Scholar to see the popularity of it yourself. Uh, so why is it so? Well, this is because GE is a very flexible system. It uses a search algorithm like a genetic algorithm to search for better and better integer strings. However, it can also use other search algorithms like a particle swarm optimization, simulated annealing, or anything that can search for integer strings. Uh, it also allows you to specify any language of your choice, as long as you can specify it in the form of production rules. This means your solutions will appear in the language of your choice. It asks you to specify your problem. For example, if some data is required to evaluate the evolving programs, the user must specify that data. So GE is not problem dependent. Uh, it allows you to specify all those things. And once they are specified, GE can evolve a large variety of solutions. To give you an example of the kind of solutions it can evolve, well, it can involve an antenna, a neural network, an electronic circuit, or even complicated mathematical equations. 
And all of this is evolved by barely specifying the components we described. That is, a search algorithm, a grammar, and a problem specification. Now, if you're interested in knowing more about genetic programming or grammatical evolution, there are thousands of applications of them, and you can easily search for them on Google. I'm leaving you with a few popular references on screen, and the links to them are also available in the description below. Hope you were intrigued by the power of these algorithms, and I shall return to some applications in the next video. Bye for